talk with you today, Marlene. I really enjoyed the conversation we had a few days ago, and uh, I learned a lot, um, and I'm sure the group here will learn a lot too. So let's start first by, would you introduce yourself and tell the, the group here a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, I, Marlene DeLuca, I uh, currently work at PGM Real Estate. I've been there for about a year and a half now. I joined in August of 2019, so I was lucky to have a good six months under my belt before we went, well, all went into a quarantine and lockdown. Um, I, in that role, I um, currently oversee marketing across our investment and lending business and have a team of marketers under me uh, focused on communications, digital marketing, product marketing, events, RFP and thought leadership development. Uh, prior to joining PGM, I was with JP Morgan uh, for a good part of my career, uh, 20 plus years, and uh, had a lot of roles there. And the, the role I most recently held was heading up marketing for the funds business, which was focused on selling mutual funds and ETFs to financial intermediaries. So think about financial advisors and other institutions that are, are kind of positioning those products in clients' portfolios. Got it. Great. Great. All right. Well, let's um, let's have some fun with this. We talked about this earlier. Um, I, I became familiar with Vogue 73 questions, rapid response questions, um, where they interview all kinds of people and it's uh, and it is rapid response. So I know we talked about some of these. So let's have some fun with it. Uh, so the group can kind of get to know you a little bit more and uh, and then we'll dive into some more uh, detailed questions, but let's first start off. What's your favorite band? Uh, you know, I, I love listening to John Denver. It puts me in the mountains and it, it, it takes me back in time. <laughs> All right. I was not expecting that one, but I love it. I love it. All right. What's the most adventurous thing that you've ever done? Uh, you know, let me think. That's a good one. Um, I, I think actually uh, very adventurous and memorable was hiking in Hawaii um, over the hot lava, which I'm not sure if they let you do, but it was an active volcano at the time and we were literally dodging across it and it was it was pretty exciting. Oh, that sounds good. That sounds good. All right. So once the lockdown is over, where do you most want to go? I would love to go to Italy. I It is one of my favorite places to spend time. I would like to picture myself sitting outside drinking a nice cappuccino and having some amazing Italian food. Yeah. Um, I will say I'm planning to take, we rescheduled a trip to Yellowstone National Park that was supposed to happen this summer that's now scheduled next summer. So that will definitely hopefully be in the cards. They both sound good. We had plans to go to the Grand Cayman and obviously that got canceled. So we may try to do that again um, at some time. We'll see how it all plays out. Um, all right. Uh, so if you were to look at yourself, what would be your superpower? I think um, I think taking complicated things and, and simplifying them and helping to distill distill information, take a problem and focus on what needs to be done and solving it. That's what I would say. That's great. That's uh, not everyone is good at that. Um, that's uh, that's a great one. So, OK, what is your favorite accomplishment so far? in your life? <laughs> That's hard to say. I would say from a career standpoint, I've felt very fortunate um, to have had a lot of different roles where I've um, continued to learn. I think it's great when you can say you're learning and ad adding value at the same time. Um, I maybe personally learning to ski as an adult, I would call as I'm uh, putting it up there as an accomplishment. I can't keep up with my kids at this point, but I can hold my own and um, it makes at least so that I can participate in the family vacations. That's a good one. Uh, a few years ago, I finally learned how to really swim. So that was uh, a big thing for me uh, with my son getting his uh, Eagle um, Scout uh, with Boy Scouts. Uh, part of that was a big scuba diving trip and, and learning to swim was an important part of that. So good accomplishments there. Um, all right, so as we look to next year, I can't believe it's December 1st, but as you look to next year, what is one of your top goals and what do you want to achieve in 2021? I would say um, I've spent 2020 in, in a little slower pace than I would have liked helping to build the team and, and kind of find finite roles within the group as I joined just at the you know mid to end of last year. So I think trying to really ensure that we can demonstrate the value of the team and focus on how we're building out the metrics and the right framework around those things is, is really one of my top goals for next year. Yeah, yeah, it certainly has changed that dynamic of everything from 
working with marketing team and with the, all the different groups that we engage with. So I totally get it. That's a good one. And then um, you know, what's a life lesson that you would like to share with the group here? You know, I'll, I'll take a stab at the, it's really the prioritizing family element, which I think is easy to say. And I think in the big things, it's easy to say, well, of, of course, I'm going to, you know, not, not miss those real milestone things. But I would say one of the lessons that somebody had shared with me once is it's those more little things that if you can prioritize that field trip or that school concert, you'll never forget those moments, but you will not remember that business meeting you thought was more important than those things. So I, I just, I took that to heart and I, I do think that it's a good guiding principle. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, okay. This will be the last rapid response question I asked. So, um, is marketing a science or an art to you? Oh, that's easy. It's both. <laughs> okay. Um, I, you know, I, I found myself in marketing, quite frankly. I came with an engineering background. I, I literally, if you'd asked me what I would be when I grew up at that stage of life when I graduated college, I think marketing would probably be the last on the list. I just never envisioned it. I didn't understand the discipline. Um, and, and I was lucky, I think, to find my way into marketing. And part of that was some of the work I had been doing on thought leadership development and working on the markets and how you explain to clients what's happening. Um, and now and now that I'm on this side and, and, and I've seen marketing evolve in terms of the importance of data and utilizing data to help um, make decisions and measure impact. So, you know, but, but there's always art and science to it. You're never going to scientifically say, that X, Y, and Z 100% influenced some outcome. I mean, it'd be nice if we could, but in many cases, there's a lot of variables involved. But um, it, it, marketing has gotten a lot smarter over the years, and I think it's um, it's an exciting place to be. But yet, you can't turn off the creativity because the creativity is what differentiates um, one campaign from another and the memorabilia memorability of of, of your efforts. So um, it really needs to work together. Yeah, that's that's great. I love that background that you come from and. You know, getting a view of, of different worlds, I think, makes you a stronger marketer, right? And if you just only grew up in marketing, you might not be able to see everything. You have a different background. I think it helps. Um, I started out as a finance person and ended up in marketing. So we all take different paths to get here, which is which is pretty interesting. So I uh, would love to hear a little bit more about your company and, you know, and what what the, the group does. Um, I know there's a video. So is that something that we can get to come on here through the brand innovator group? Yeah, may maybe I'll give a little bit of a background. There we go. go
So um, thank you for playing that. More about it. You back? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Well. So I'll give a little bit of background. Uh, the, the video, obviously, um, something I'm, I'm quite proud of. It's uh, something we created uh, as I after I joined and we rolled out this summer. Um, and PGM real estate is is a is a, a part of Prudential. It's part of the PGM investment management business, and it is run as an independent affiliate. So PGM is a is a group of affiliates that have different investment disciplines, and PGM real estate focuses on the real estate area. Um, and within our business, we focus both on investments and in providing financing for commercial commercial borrowers. Um, and you know, the, the video is a little more focused on the audience around the investor community. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the development of that. But you know, at, at, at its core, we are providing, um, taking in third party capital. So taking say institutional investors or um, increasingly, you know, not as much now, but growing part of our business, um, you know, some form of high net worth money as well and investing that um, on behalf of those individuals. So we're fiduciaries for those for those individuals. And as, as we like to keep in mind, you know, we really have an end client, right? The institutional clients are our immediate client. You know, they are investing on behalf of the employees at their firms or the public workers that we, we see every day. And it's important that we have that mindset of who who's really benefiting in the end. Um, but what's been exciting for me in the, to join this business is the tangibility of real estate and the ability, you know, of not just buying stocks and bonds to help a portfolio grow, but we're truly investing in properties and communities that we want to have a financial return. But there's often additional benefits that come from the, the investments that we're making globally. Um, and so and so that's the investment side of the business. And it, we have a variety of product types in terms of the types of investments we'll make and how far along they are in development and how risky those investments could be. Um, and then and then there's this entire other side of the business where commercial developers need to help finance projects and they can come to PGM Real Estate to help finance those deals as well. Um, and then and then we have development partners as well. They're not our kind of first or secondary client call it, but um, we do partner with those folks as well on executing on, on some of these these projects. That's great. I mean, sounds like one uh, heck of a big job, right, to come into and to try to organize. And, you know, I guess my next question would be, you know, based off of that, you know, how important is it for you to kind of set a vision for the group and to collaborate and clearly communicate all this across your entire organization and all your customers and all the stakeholders? Yeah, no, it's very, very important. And I came in at an exciting time for the business where two two businesses, that investment business and lending business were coming together. So it was a natural point to stop and say, okay, how do we position ourselves in the market? How do we ensure we don't, um, you know, stray away from what was been core to our um, investment beliefs and our, and our general business practices, but are we articulating it in a clear way for our clients? And so we did spend some time when I first joined thinking about how, how we framed that. Uh, and it really becomes the foundation, right? That everything needs to be built upon when when you think about a messaging hierarchy and, and how you're going to present yourself in the market. And not every communication is going to tout every element of your vision or come back to every principle, but it, it needs to all be rooted there. And um, I would say with the creation of the video, while I had an external audience in mind, I might have underestimated the impact this would have internally and the ability for people to really feel like they, they could see um, what what we stand for and how we're, where we're headed and just the excitement and, and um, reception we've had to this has been really, really great. Well, that's great, good to hear. Um, big role, absolutely. Um, I guess with that, you know, coming into, 2020 and the and the pandemic and the like, you know, um, how how did you react to that and how did you change your your marketing uh, playbook to you know try to adjust to everything that's going on in the world right now? Yeah, I mean, we definitely as a marketing organization and as a business had goals set out for the year, and um, I think the first thing we had to do, and when I really think back to the March timeframe when everything really started to feel pretty real was um, first and foremost, just stop and examine what, what we were working on and where those priorities stood and and really pivot to some extent to what the client need was at the time. So while we have these long-term things we were trying to you know, stabilize and move forward on, we had to first and foremost ensure that we were communicating to our clients 
at this time. I, I had learned back from, in, you know, my experience when going through the financial crisis, there's nothing that, that you know, you can do better than staying in front of clients and um, providing whatever information they need at the time they need it and being forthcoming, even when you don't know all the answers, right? It's, uh, we're here for you. We're, we're working on this. We're trying to get the information that you're asking for. Um, I would say after that moment, right, where we kind of had to get grounded and figure out what we needed to do more reactively, it became a, a, a pivot point to say, okay, what can we do more proactively? How can we stay in front of clients? How can we, um, you know, not take advantage of the situation, but really make sure we were um, acknowledging what was happening. And then, and then separately focusing on those longer term priorities and not losing sight, right? How do you keep the team motivated and, and, and recreate that work dynamic that is no longer everyone being pulled into a conference room um, to work through, but now, as we were, for example, working on a, a website rollout, you know, we needed to, to continue with that momentum and we had to find other ways to, um, to kind of recreate what would have been in person diagramming and whiteboarding and, 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 and kind of mocking up pages and all that all had to be done remotely. Yeah. Yeah. You, we had talked about a couple of days ago, just about, you know, innovation and how you continue to innovate and maybe accelerate some things and through portal and all that kind of stuff. Can you share with the group here, you know, kind of what the thought process was and, you know, how you think it all came out? Yeah. Um, there were a couple of different things that, that we we've done and, and did at the time. One was we happened to be, I'd say, luckily already in, in the prog process of, of, launching a new investor portal. So a place where our investors could come and access information about the products that they're invested in, which sounds quite simple. And anyone in a more retail business, you know, these are the kinds of things you need to operate on a day-to-day -day basis. But in this business, you know, emailing out statements or, you know, having a kind of heritage portal that was old, but like clunky, but still got, did the job, it was okay. Um, but we were we were in the process of, of moving in on our digital transformation to, to doing this. And we actually, um, moved up the timeline and we expedited the onboarding of our clients so that we could utilize the portal as a place to constantly um, update um, information around questions that people had um, and, and information around products rather than having to bombard people with emails, right? Because that was our traditional way of communicating with clients was to send them an email. And that works fine if you've got quarterly communications, but not when things are changing daily. And you wanted we wanted to let clients know that this would be the place that they could come to get the latest information. We were going to update it. Um, we would clearly alert them when there was something really big that they needed to go and check out. But for the most part, we wanted to um, really kind of almost introduce this and change behavior as to where they could come to expect um, that information. That's good. Yeah. I mean, constantly innovating in, you know, like you said, give customers access to the data they need uh, during these challenging times is a really, you know, important part of, of what marketers have to do. Um, uh, we're starting to get some good questions come in, so please uh, feel free to continue to add them. We'll come to them at the end. I think we've got about four more questions um, that we'll just talk through directly and then we'll jump to them. Um, but going through all that you've gone through in 2020, you know, and uh, obviously, um, you know, the pandemic is still uh, going on and, and everybody knows kind of the challenges that are going on um, today, right? And at the same time, there's hopefully a, a light at the end of the tunnel with vaccines and things like that, but who knows the timing, right? So looking to 2021, you know, what are your goals and, you know, what are you going to do different? And, you know, um, how, do you, how do you succeed in this really challenging world out there? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I think first and foremost, it's trying to make sure our teams stay motivated and connected. And I, I joined in at that and heard a little bit of the end of the last session, but um, I think it's really important to um, in, ensure that we have connectivity with team members that is outside of the, the meeting format um, and, and being sensitive to everyone's different personal needs and challenges. So, so first and foremost, people need to, to be functioning at their best. Um, I would say, you know, aside from that, and more specifically around our priorities, you know, we're, we're continuing on our digital transformation. So, I want to continue on, on the efforts we've started. Um, it's a really big part of, of our overall strategy. You know, I, I would also say it's understanding where behavior might change or how we think about our sales process. Our sales process traditionally has been very um, high touch. Uh, individual sales reps going out and traveling to meet with um, institutional clients. 
and that's really important. But um, you know what we're now looking at ways that we can um, bring the the meeting to to the client in that digital way. We've all had to adopt to to the Zoom and the you know face you know replacing face to face meetings with these digital meetings. But we're looking at ways to to replace property tours with. Um, videos and and not the just a video of let me just show you the asset, but truly um, providing the context around the investment and, and why we've made that investment in that type of property and what that what that means um, to the overall overall portfolio. So, you know, we're doing a lot more with packaging up videos and trying to bring to life some of the acquisitions we're making um, in our in our funds. And then uh, on on the borrower side, I think it's you know it's a very much a, a people business. So it's how do you stay in front of those clients? How are you top of mind when those needs come up and they're, and they're trying to access capital? Um, and, and it, you know, that it can be a combination of email outreach and offering up, you know, speakers and events and, um, and things like that. But I think all of, of those are things that we're thinking about as, as we approach next year. Yeah, uh, it's great. You know, I think how you, you said these immersive experience video experiences that you're coming up with it, it offers a more compelling way today for people to experience the properties and you know probably be something that will continue well after hopefully this pandemic is behind us right so this gives us gives you guys something else and in, in, in addition to the face-to-face -face meetings to really help benefit the clients that's uh, that's an exciting thing um and you kind of talked about it you know to best engage with clients, you know, uh, through these different approaches, you know, have you gotten any responses uh, from them or any feedback from them on how that's been and how it's helped them during these challenging times? Yeah, I mean, our, the feedback has been positive. Um, we held a, a virtual client conference. You know, that's something that we've done in person every year um, and and had to, you know, obviously cancel it. And so it took us a little bit of time. We um, wanted to really take a step back and think about what would this mean virtually, right? We're not going to replicate two days of in-person meetings with with two days of virtual meetings. And I think what we ended up doing was coming up with a format that really worked. I mean, we did a high touch, um, you know, technology platform, and um, we really focused in on short segments that were 15 or 20 minute presentations, which is really not the norm, right? I think it, you know the the norm had been, you know, let's do the 45 minute panel and get five people up on a stage and have a dialogue. And, you know, you lose people in that environment in the digital world. And so we focused on simple graphics, supporting statements, short time frames, topic to topic, um, you know, anchored with some strong keynotes to happen to be around the political time frame where we could have some commentary around what was happening, which was, uh, you know, interesting, of, of course. Um, but I, I think those are those are some of the things we're, we're doing. And I think, again, trying to find topics that are interesting to clients that we can host a webinar on, you know, do a short piece on, but really just trying to find that balance of what we're hearing from clients in terms of questions, what our sales teams are hearing and, and what we can do um, proactively to stay to stay top of mind. Yeah, that's great. I, you know, I think you're, you're right on, especially you know, we we're all on Zoom so often to be on it for two days. You know, uh, as we would in a normal conference, it's just it's not realistic. And those tiny bites of content, 15, 20 minutes, that's I think a great idea. It's a great way to, you know, have an impact. And you know, but you know, without people getting kind of worn out from uh, being on Zoom all the time, it's it's a great idea. Um, from a standpoint of engaging with your sales or business development folks, you know, how how do you engage with them to ensure jointly you got you're both being successful? You're helping them be successful and you're giving them what they need. And um, you know, you're you're helping both at the top level branding perspective, but also, you know, driving, you know, the right kind of business conversations. How do you work together with the sales team? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel very fortunate that we have a pretty open culture and have a lot of opportunities to bounce ideas off. And of course, it's been more challenging to not have those in the hallway water cooler conversations um, and to, to be a little more scheduled in terms of those team meetings where um, you have to kind of tee, tee up the questions and, and, and it'd be a tiny bit more formal than it might otherwise. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's, a ba it's a back and forth, right? It's hearing what they're hearing from clients. You know, the world evolved. It went from a how long will this be? 
it, it may not be that long into will this ever end? And I, I think right. nobody really predicted we'd be in this state this long. I think it was nobody really wanted to think that far and, and think think that it would end up that way. Um, and so we've adjusted, uh, of course, adjusted as as we've gone. Um, and and I think too, oftentimes that there's an element of you know, yes, sales might have a good idea that we can take and leverage and then figure out how to scale for call it broad set of clients. But equally, there have been some, you know, incremental changes we've made to our process and procedures that, you know, maybe at first weren't received, you know, open arms. But I think that showing data and information, for example, just the simple task of sending an email and not attaching something, but sending a link to the web any instead to get the access to that information, right? Some of these things are things that, you know, we've other organizations have done 10 plus years ago, but in other industries, it was just like, well, that's what the clients want. They want the attachment. They want it to be easy. And it's like, well, if we send them to the web, we can track that they clicked it and we can show them other content on the right hand rail, right? Like those are all basic mm -hmm. things sometimes or some of the things we're working on. Yep, that's great. And it's having an impact. And then I guess communicating up or, you know, with your leadership team, you know, how has that been over? the past year and, you know, um, give us your thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, our leadership team has been very engaged from the start on a lot of the efforts that we've we've done. So it's not so much a here's all the things we did and here's the report out at the end of the quarter. I'd say it's a little more fluid than that. It's here's what we're working on. And, um, you know, we, we do get a lot of engagement um, and input from from senior management. And I think it's everybody would love to say that it's all based on data, right? The data shows the results are here. Um, and that's clearly the mindset that I start with. Um, what can we demonstrate and what can we showcase from that standpoint? But I would also say it kind of comes back a little to that art, right? There are many influential points in the sales process um, and I recognize that. And so I think that you have to be smart about how you demonstrate the impact you're having along the way, whether it's always a metric or not always a metric. Um, I think that there are a lot of other ways that you can you know, showcase that. And, and I think some of the, results we've seen, you know, really come from client feedback, the portfolio managers feedback, right? One portfolio management team is seeing what we're doing for another portfolio management team says, hey, I'd really like a video that showcases X, Y, Z, or could you take a look at my pitch book? Uh, I see how you simplified, you know, X, Y, Z's message. I'd love, I'd love for your team to take a crack at mine. So, you know, these things happen a little organically as well. And I think sometimes that it's almost that recommendation, but internally um that allows you to demonstrate that what you're doing is having an impact yeah it's always great when word gets out that marketing is really helping and they start coming to you for help right and it's a wonderful thing last question and then we'll go to q a is you know you've recently changed jobs you know what advice would you give to someone you know going through the same type of thing right now that's a that's a good question um i would say first of all if foremost, it's coming in and listening, right? You've got to get a lay of the land. Um, you've got to just understand how things have been done. Try to get it why they've been done that way. Learn the business, right? Because nobody's going to know everything on, on day one, even if you came from a similar industry. Um, and then I do think the, the, the most important thing is, is a, leveraging the fact that you have a new fresh set of eyes, right? And asking those questions around why things have been done that way. So you listen first, soak in as much as you can. And then I think quickly try to pivot and, and really challenge the status quo. And, and I think the, the hard part, but what will make somebody successful in, in a role change is trying to really boil down where can you have the greatest impact in a short amount of time, right? So you want to look at the 30, 60, 90 days. It's pretty common like approach to say, how, how what am I going to try to tackle and when? Um, but I think being able to pick some of the low hanging fruit, but then start initiatives that, you know, are going to take longer, but you set the groundwork early so that those things get underway. It's, it's a combination. And, you know, lastly, I would say it's just really surrounding yourself with the right team and figuring out what, you know, folks are there and how they're working. And then how do you complement whatever skill sets are there? If there's, if there's areas that you feel could be, could be lacking or just not having had experience in before. Got it. That's good. That's good advice. All right. So there's now a lot of questions. So we'll try to get through them here um, with the time that we have left. So uh, predictions for 2021. Any, you know, one or two that you're thinking about? Everybody's asking that question right now. Predictions. Um, 
it, that's hard to say. Um, I, I think I'm not sure which angle to, to, to take, but um, I think that, um, look, I, I think that the markets have been surprisingly resilient. So um, I think we're all somewhat hopeful that that, that bottom doesn't fall out. Um, I think that there's a lot of discussion around where where we all end up in terms of our workplace habits, right? So what will the future of work look like? I mean, it is the million dollar question. I think that um, no question the technology kind of was on that high spike of, right? We've all, and as I think, you know, co many companies have invested in a lot of great tools and technology that make remote working um, and flexible working, uh, probably more of a reality than, uh, um, than it was ever before. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, but I do think that nothing will replace that in-person meeting and, and that, you know, collaboration space. So, you know, people are always asking, what's the future of office? It's like, there's, there will be office. It's just a question of what it looks like, um, and, and how you maneuver it, but people need a place to, to come together and, and, and work both professionally and, and the social interactions, right? Yeah, yeah, that was talked about in the last session, the importance of social interaction. And speaking of that, you know, uh, next question is, have you been able to build, you know, any personal relationships with colleagues or with partners during this time when we're all remote? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say in the beginning, um, you know, we had some video technology and people were quite hesitant to turn the cameras on. And I, it was almost that dread of what I oh, was a video call. Geez, like, what am I wearing? Is my hair combed? And mm -hmm. I think what really just broke down that barrier was when it became like everybody had it. And then, you know, the bar seemed to come down a little bit and the expectations of how dressed up people got for video calls and work from home every day. And so... Right. Um, I think, you know, that has just allowed, right, us to, to, I think people's guards came down pretty quickly. I think in the beginning, guards were up, guards came down, people's pets are walking through their rooms, right? It's like kids pop in, they're grabbing something behind someone. It's okay. Like all of this stuff has now become okay. And I think those become points where you just naturally can bond with your team, again, in a smaller setting. Um, where you're learning about what's happening in people's lives in that aspect. So, and then, and then trying to do those kind of social t things. Um, we've had a variety of different things from large scale um, to smaller team. You know, I, I, we've all been on Zoom drinks where you're like three pages in of people and like one person is monopolizing the conversation and that's just a bit <laughs> awkward. Um, but we've done cooking things where we've had chefs um, come on and do chocolate making around Halloween and people brought their kids. So, you know, there's a lot of different things we've, we've tried. And I, I think the more informal and the ones that also involve people's families have actually worked really well because like at six o'clock or 530, do I want to do an activity that's keeping me in my office even longer or do I want to go down in my kitchen and engage with my kids in some way? Yeah, yeah. I think there's some there are great ideas there. One of the things we're doing for the holidays, we're inviting customers and things like that to a magician event. The magician who's been on the Tonight Show and all that kind of uh, uh, great um, showmanship, uh, we're doing a, a personal view of that. And those type of things, I think, build great relationships, not only with people within your organization, but with customers as well. They're fun. All right, next question is, uh, what do you look for when hiring team members? That's a good one. Um, you know, I think it's a it's a combination of you know obviously you've got your your basic table stakes of whatever the role calls for, right? Is that level of experience there? Is the person capable, hardworking, um, and and you know can really articulate some of, of the accomplishments that they've had in their career? But I, I would say on the softer side, it's it's there is an element of that of that um, cultural fit, and and that's always hard to describe, but. You know, somebody who can communicate well, um, feels like they're bringing themselves right to that conversation. Again, you know, we're not meeting with people in person, but we are doing video calls. And I think it's just important to see um, whether or not somebody opens up and, and has that other side. You're never not necessarily going to get all that from a first conversation. And I think it's really important in this environment um, to, to, you know, to have a few different conversations along the way, especially for a more senior hire. Yeah. Um, good question here. You know, what's the biggest lesson that you think marketers have learned this year? Um, I mean, for, I, I would say for us and, and my team, it's been the, the way we work um, and the, you know, leveraging these collaboration tools that we've had but hadn't probably utilized. I mean, everything 
it's not just the video meeting capability. I mean, we're, we're using Microsoft Teams and it's, it's the kind of, kind of having these specialized chats where we're doing collaboration for projects within those frameworks. Um, and taking things out of email. I just think that our working style in my, in my past career and in my, when I first started here was very much email based. It's like email this, email that attachment and the collaboration tools of multiple people working on one document at the same time. Um, and, and this kind of, you know, chat rooms for certain projects, I think has really increased our productivity and the collaborational element of, of how we accomplish things um, has also, I think, increased a lot. Got it. That's good. Um, from a standpoint of, you know, hiring both marketing and, you know, techno technology savvy um, people to your organization, you know, what approach do you take to try to find those really hard to find, you know, people with that type of background? Um, I mean, you know, it obviously depends on the role. Um, I, I think networks are, are very important. I, I think it does help to have um, folks that you can reach out to, not, not only for recommendations, because I'm not necessarily inferring that you need to know somebody to get that introduction, but I do think that um, it helps as, as you're interviewing candidates that have worked at different places to see what you can you know, find out if you speak to folks who might have also worked at those places. I, I think it is hard, right? You're taking a leap of faith um, oftentimes based on what a candidate is, is telling you they're capable of. And so um, any way you can, you know, put that to the test is good. I've, you know, definitely hired roles where we've had actual tests, which I try to avoid. I mean, it's not, it doesn't always, um, it's sometimes a little hard to administer call it, but there are some roles where I, I do think you, you actually want to, you know, put put something out there, whether you're hiring an investment writer, it's like, okay, well, you know, here's an interview we did with someone, could you write a summary? And and you actually have some tangible work product to, to look for um, as you're evaluating some of those. But uh, from a digital, the digital marketing combination is, is, is challenging. Um, and, and I think in, in this world, again, I think in the beginning, people were probably gun shy to even make moves. And I think that People were a little like, let me wait and see what happens. I think now that there's been this longer time frame, um, there's a lot more openness for for people in changing jobs during this environment. Yeah, that's good. And then, you know, obviously we're all working from home and our teams are too. You know, what are, you know, how is your work-life balance and how, how do you ensure your team members have work-life balance as well? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the meetings are, are creep up, right? They're the back-to-backs a thousand percent still exists. Um, and sometimes the only break you get is by putting your camera off and stepping out of the room for a minute. Um, but um, I, I would say, you know, it's important. And there are periods, right? I have found the cyclicality of we're working up to a deadline. A few of us are engaging a couple nights a week. You know, you, you step away for dinner, then you're coming back. It's just almost too easy, right? Your computer's right there. You're connected to people. Um, and so I find myself trying not to ping people or even send the emails um, because I know they're gonna respond and I don't wanna put that pressure on people. Um, one of the things that I, I was impressed with within our organization um, that the, you know one of the senior leaders has, has stated is, let's try to keep an, an hour in the afternoon open, it's at two to three. It's, it's dark at 4.30 or five. So there's no more going for a walk after work. Um, you know, so we kind of have this, uh, you know, un unofficial time block from two to three where we're trying not to schedule meetings so that we can give people that fresh air time to just get outside their office, w w take a walk, even 15 minutes. I mean, it does it does a mind wonders to, to do that. Yeah, I, I've actually blocked a half an hour on my calendar right at noon if I can. And I've asked my team to do the same thing. And, and I call it the team walk in. You know, we all just try to get out and get some fresh air because otherwise, you know, like you said, it's dark by 430 and that's pretty tough. So keeping that, um, you know, balance, I think, is really important. Um, so it's a great answer. Well, looks like um, Emily's coming back on. Um, so, yes. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for such a great session. Um, and <clears throat> You're encouraging me to get outside right now and take a take a walk because I feel like that's so important for everyone's you know mental health and our uh, you know productivity throughout the day. So love love ending on that note and thank you both so much. Hope to have you back again soon, Marlene and Dan. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Marlene. It was a lot of fun.
Bye. All right, and we're next up, we're on to our final session of the day. Um, and so last but not least, we'll be hearing from Abby Lee, the SVP of Marketing and Communications at Remax. And her session will be moderated by Uma Kanapan, the Product Marketing Director at New Star. Welcome, ladies. Hi, Emily. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, good. And hi, Abby. Good. Hi there. I'm just getting my video. Always takes a second. <laughs> I know. It's giving me a weird start video open. Hold on. Sorry, guys. No problem. Mm -hmm. It no, is. No, you know, as, as the months have gone on, we've dealt with our fair share of technical issues um, with <laughs> everything under the sun. So we know it, it's always hard to get everything um, squared away. So no problem at all. Where are you tuning so in? It is, not, it is not giving me an option to start the camera. Okay, let me see. Let me check with my team really quick. Um, it's giving me FaceTime HD camera. I think we could just start with with your your audio unless the FaceTime HD works. Um, you could try try that, but if not, um, you know, we'd still love to just have you guys chat okay. using the audio if that's if that's the only thing that works. Yeah, it's just not letting me. Oh wait, there we go. Got there it. There we go. Yay! Yeah. Oh, good. Yay! <laughs> so that's always worth a couple tr troubleshooting options, but once once uh, you know we tried a few, don't want to 